Model trains have thrilled little children for generations. What began as a simple toy has evolved into a super sophisticated miniature masterpiece. Next, the rise, fall, and rebirth of America's toy train makers. There is no way to overstate the influence of the railroad in America. For generations, the process of moving passengers and hauling freight touched just about every aspect of life. The grand drama that was played out at the switchyards and terminals had a spectacular theatrical quality. For a child watching along the tracks, or waiting at the station, it was a deeply thrilling experience. It's no surprise then that railway toys, or model trains, appeared almost simultaneously with the real railroads. And as the real railroads changed American culture, the miniature replicas worked their own sort of magic. Toy trains transformed boys into men, and adults into children. For boys growing up before World War II, electric toy trains represented the state of the art in hobbies. They could design and build their own miniature world and control it with the flip of a switch. Back then, the debut of a toy train was as eagerly anticipated as a new video game or action figure is today. A circle of track with a locomotive and a few cars became as much a part of the holiday as Santa Claus and the Christmas tree. The fate of the toy train manufacturers closely paralleled the rise and fall of the real railroads. Toy train sales were good as long as people rode trains. But when railroads went bankrupt in the age of automobiles and airliners, many toy train makers disappeared as well. Today, just as the real railroads are enjoying a revival, so too is the hobby of model railroading. Colorful wooden trains still introduce young minds and little hands to the world of make-believe. And scale model masterpieces, near replicas of the real thing, are more popular than ever. The National Toy Train Museum in Strasburg, Pennsylvania, established by the Train Collectors Association, draws almost 70,000 visitors to its operating layouts and exhibits every year. There is even a monthly magazine marking its 10th anniversary that reaches an estimated 75,000 hobbyists, and its popularity continues to grow. In the year 2000, America's premier model train company, Lionel, will celebrate a century of building electric trains. The company whose name became synonymous with toy trains survived the Great Depression, but fell victim to the fickle interests of children in the 1960s. Today, Lionel is back and building on its tradition of innovation to lead model railroading into the digital age. 
in playing with trains, children and adults alike can learn an awful lot about imagination and creativity. We make an earnest attempt not to do everything for the child. In other words, there's so many products that uh, you sit there and they entertain you. There's, no, there, there's nothing left to the child or the adult to do. Uh, we are always conscious of that and making sh make sure that we only serve to stimulate the mind. European toy manufacturers were the first to stimulate young minds with toy trains. In the 1840s, the Stevens Model Dockyard Company of London, England built locomotive models just about a foot long that were honest-to-goodness steam engines fueled by alcohol and water. They called them mechanical recreations and instructive amusements, but their boilers and valves leaked so often they were better known as dribblers. The alcohol would actually be poured by the, the young operator into the boiler of the, of the tiny little locomotive and then they would basically light a match to it. And it seems pretty dangerous simply because sometimes it, it, it might tip over as it's traveling across the floor and then set the rug on fire and little pits of flames and alcohol and mothers were not always very pleased with that. American children didn't have to worry about setting the house on fire with their toy trains. Their first trains were simple wooden pull toys. Lithographed paper glued over the wood shapes added some intricate details. The bells and whistles, however, were left to the child's imagination. Children also enjoyed trains made of tin. The whimsical shapes and colors of the tin toys were more fantasy than reality. And like the wooden trains, tin trains had to be pulled across the floor with a string. Cast iron also made good toys. Considered the plastic of its day, cast iron was plentiful, inexpensive, and relatively easy to mold into durable trains. In 1874, an American toy builder named Edward Ives, founder of the Ives Toy Company of Connecticut, added spring-wound motors to the cast iron trains that he was making. The little trains, called clockworks, zipped across the floor under their own power. The spring-wound trains worked their magic and won the hearts of little children. The clockwork trains established Ives as the first leader in toy train manufacturing in the U.S. In Germany, Eugene and Karl Merklin operated the most famous toy company in the world. The tinsmiths and artisans at Merklin created all sorts of toys, including wind-up clockwork trains elegantly decorated by hand. In 1891, at the annual toy fair in Leipzig, the Merklin brothers unveiled a new line of clockwork trains, and for the first time, a collection of beautifully handcrafted stations, signals, and other accessories. What Markland started to develop was this idea of a toy train system. So that not only were you buying a train, because after all, how many trains could a kid buy? But after you bought the train, then you wanted a station, and then you wanted a crossing gate, and then you wanted a little shanty that went beside the uh, track with a little man in it. So Markland was sort of developing this whole idea of a train system. Merklin also established standard sizes for toy trains and truck based on gauge or the distance between the two rails. This meant that as long as they were of the same gauge, different trains from different manufacturers could be run on the same track. Marklin uh, was the innovator in terms of helping uh, young hobbyists 
create layouts with both track, trains, and accessories. They could really begin to create a little world to mimic what they were seeing in real life. Merklin exported its new collection of trains and accessories to the United States and competed with the Ives Company for the attention of American children and the dollars of American parents. As the two manufacturers repeatedly one-upped each other with better trains, neither company seemed to pay much notice to a few electric trolleys offered by a 23-year-old New York inventor named Joshua Cowan. At the turn of the century, while the big toy train makers battled each other for domination, a small-time inventor from New York launched his own campaign to win the hearts of American children. Born in 1877 in New York's Lower East Side, Joshua Cowan was the eighth of nine children. Early on, he demonstrated an aptitude for building things. In 1899, at the age of 22, Cowan patented his first invention, a battery-operated device to ignite a photographer's flash powder. In 1900, he built a small battery-powered electric fan that he sold door to door. Unfortunately, with the end of summer, no one wanted to buy a fan. As the weather cooled, Cowan looked for a new use for his little electric motor. This guy's a merchandiser, just by instinct. And he loves to look in store windows. He looks in the store window, and he sees these beautiful toys of the day, but nothing's moving. He's got a static window. And Cowan goes in to the guy, whose name is Robert Ingersoll, and he says, look, I'll create a little device. It'll be like a cigar box on wheels, and I'll have some track, and it'll go round and round in your window, and it'll draw piece, people's attention to this merchandise you have that's not doing anything, that's just sitting there. Cowan quickly cobbled together his first electric train and set it up inside Ingersoll's toy store. It ran on two metal rails set in wooden ties. Batteries wired to the track provided the power. Cowan called it the Electric Express. Two days later, Ingersoll says to Cowan, he said, listen, he said, all my stuff is still in the window. He said, but I sold that little uh, cigar box train you got me. He said, could you make me another one? Joshua Cowan sold more cars at $6 a piece. He formed a company and gave the firm his middle name, the Lionel Manufacturing Company. Now, Cowan was not the first to assemble an electric train. A small Cincinnati firm named Carlisle and Finch had been selling electric trains since 1896. Merklin had also experimented with electric trains in Germany, but some clever marketing made up for Cowan's late entry into the game. In 1906, Cowan stopped making the two-rail track and announced the debut of some new trains and a new style three-rail track. Although the new track didn't look realistic, the additional third rail had a critical advantage. With the old style two-rail track, an electric train motor picked up current from one rail, the positive side, and returned it to the other rail, the negative side. That worked fine until someone laid out a complex track plan. If the track curved back on itself through a switch, the negative rail would contact the positive rail and this would cause a short circuit. The three rail track eliminated this problem. The center rail was positive and both outside rails were negative. In complex track plans, Negative rails touched only negative rails, and positive only positive. This put an end to short circuits. Cowan's three-rail track revolutionized the hobby. Now, in Cowan's merchandising genius, he says this is standard gauge track. It's two and an eighth inches in, in uh, track gauge. Now, really, that was not standard. The standard was two inches. You might, in fact, have called it odd gauge instead of standard gauge. Cowan's claim that his new trains and track were standard gauge 
convinced buyers that his products were superior to the apparently non-standard trains of his competitors, and Lionel's sales jumped substantially. Lionel got yet another boost in profits from a completely unexpected source. World War I was a godsend for Cowan's young company. When America joined the war in 1917, German imports to the U.S. were cut off. German toys, including Merklin's trains, disappeared from store shelves, and American trains quickly filled the void. In 1917, as if adding insult to injury, Cowan produced a little electric armored war train, bristling with cannons, to help American boys and their American trains clear the track of the dreaded Hun. Lionel's standard gauge train sets reached their pinnacle in the late 1920s. Loaded with detail and plenty of features, the steel locomotives and their passenger cars weighed nearly 25 pounds and stretched almost six feet. Lionel's most elaborate standard gauge set cost $110. The same money could buy a brand new refrigerator or a used Model T. But Cowan had little to worry about. His profits grew and the competition faded away. Ives couldn't keep up with Cowan's aggressive marketing and declared bankruptcy in 1928. Merklin and the other German companies had yet to recover from the First World War. In two decades, Joshua Cowan had come to rule the world of toy trains. The future looked limitless. In October 1929, the stock market crashed and threw the country into a Great Depression. Families that once had money to spend for toy trains didn't have enough for food or shelter. Lionel, like all other companies, was hit bad by the Depression. It really hit hard. So to protect itself from creditors, it goes into what's called a friendly equity receivership, in which uh, Cowan and his people could still continue to run the company, but they have to clear decisions with uh, people from the banks. But too many standard gauge trains were chasing too few dollars. By 1934, Lionel was in debt nearly a quarter of a million dollars. Things looked bad, but Cowan wasn't ready to call it quits. Cowan needed to raise a lot of cash to save his glorious line of electric trains. For help, he turned to an unlikely hero, a plucky little mouse named Mickey. In 1934, Lionel released a small wind-up handcar that featured Mickey Mouse. It came with a circle of track and sold for a dollar. Much to Cowan's relief, Christmas shoppers bought over a quarter of a million Mickey handcars. The newspapers had this wonderful story, you know, plucky Mickey comes to the rescue once again, saves toy train giant from bankruptcy. I think the real truth is that while the Mickey car was great and got Lionel great publicity, the thing that they sold uh, that really brought them some money was the M10,000. The country's first streamlined diesel train, the M10,000, made its grand debut in the spring of 1934. Operated by the Union Pacific Railroad, the M10,000 barnstormed the country on a 68-city publicity tour. Cowan took advantage of the media blitz. By the summer of 1934, he had what he called a scale model of the brown and yellow passenger train for sale in his catalog. With a price tag of $19.50, strong sales of the M10,000 helped bring Lionel back from the brink of bankruptcy. The popularity of the M10,000 also marked the ascendancy of O-Gage. O-Gage track has three rails, but it's smaller than standard gauge track. O-gauge rails are only an inch and a quarter apart. 
an O-gauge train is smaller and therefore less expensive, better suited for a Depression-era budget. Lionel's success with the M10,000 prompted Cowan to offer more trains based on real streamliners. In 1935, Lionel brought out its version of the Hiawatha, the magnificent orange and gray streamliner of the Milwaukee Road. That year also marked the introduction of Lionel's Commodore Vanderbilt, an O-gauge model of the New York Central Railroad's most modern locomotive. Also in 1935, Lionel unveiled the Flying Yankee, a chrome miniature of the articulated shovel-nose streamliner that ran between Boston and Portland, Maine. For Lionel, just like the real railroads, the streamliners represented progress and profit. Throughout the 30s, Lionel's catalogs grew more seductive to little boys dreaming of becoming real railroad engineers. With offerings like authentic whistles and action-packed accessories. Nothing was greater than putting a dime in an envelope and sending it off to Lionel and waiting for that catalog to come. And I can just remember just really getting excited when those big envelopes came to the house. I just loved it. The catalog was the premier wish book. Kids sat there, they doodled away their time, they put them behind their school books as I did in school, you smuggled them into your notebooks and so on, and you sat there dreaming about these trains and these empires which would be yours. In its heyday, Lionel was producing a million catalogs a, a season. Only Sears uh, and, and Montgomery Ward exceeded Lionel in the number of catalogs they were producing. But the graphic artists and copywriters at Lionel sold something more than trains and trackside accessories. The catalog presented a perfect model of how fathers and sons should relate together. And of course the implicit message was, if you don't have this relationship with your son, you're not being a good father. What will get you that relationship? Lionel trains. Lionel trains are the instrument that will introduce fathers to their own sons. There was the sense that this was a hobby that could unite the generations, that boys would have more to do with their fathers if together they operated trains and built layouts, and that fathers needed this release. They needed this escape back into remembering what it was like to be a boy. The catalogs also demonstrated that a model railroad was a blueprint for success in life. This was all designed by Lionel with the great intention, believing that the boy who controlled his miniature world now would grow up to be the man who would control the world in the future. By the late 1930s, more adults were joining the hobby of model railroading, and Joshua Cowan recognized that Lionel needed something to appeal to these more mature buyers. In 1937, Lionel released the most detailed toy train ever mass-produced, an exact replica of the most famous steam locomotive of the time, the mighty Hudson of the New York Central Railroad. It cost $75 for a toy that was a lot of money, but for a scale model, that was incredibly cheap because up to this time scale models had been made in limited runs a few hundred and so on and they had cost you know in the hundreds of dollars so suddenly here for the first time we have a mass manufacturer with mass advertising coming up with a train that was really a scale model today many collectors consider the scale hudson the finest model ever made by lionel and some examples can bring as much as $30,000 at auction. 
Lionel continued its climb out of the depression, and by the end of the decade, it was producing 350,000 train sets a year. The emphasis at Lionel had completely shifted to O-gauge realism and action. In 1939, after 33 years, the majestic standard gauge train sets disappeared from the catalog. In 1941, Lionel, along with the rest of the country, went to war. To meet growing demands for the war effort, the federal government banned toy manufacturers from using any metals or strategic materials for toys. Workers at the Lionel factory in New Jersey would have to stop making toy trains. Cowan had negotiated some contracts with the War Department so he could keep his employees at work assembling navigational equipment for the U.S. Navy. The restriction on strategic materials presented Cowan with an interesting problem. How to get Lionel trains into the hands of children without breaking the law? Nothing. Not even World War II was going to keep Joshua Lionel Cowan from making trains for children. If the government wouldn't let him have metal, he'd find something else. In 1943, Cowan came out with the Lionel Wartime Freight Train, a train made entirely from cardboard complete with cardboard accessories, cardboard track, and even cardboard people. It came in a flat box and it said insert tab A into slot A and tab B and so on. It was incredibly difficult to, uh, to assemble, but um, at least, you know, fathers could buy their boys some kind of train. And of course, there was lots of advertising that said, you know, wait, as soon as the war is over, the trains will come back. Meanwhile, play with this paper train. After World War II, Lionel picked up where it had left off. The company continued its pre-war trend towards realism and action. But Joshua Cowan was no longer the president. Just before the end of the war, the aging founder gave his 38-year-old son, Lawrence, control of the company. Lawrence had grown up with toy trains, and there had been little doubt that he would someday follow in his father's footsteps. With his father, now chairman of the board, it was Lawrence Cowan's responsibility to take Lionel to even greater heights. The best place to see Lionel trains was at its showroom in New York City. On Father's Day 1946, Lionel closed its famous New York City showroom to children and admitted only bona fide dads. A father had to bring proof uh, that, after all, he was a father. So some fathers brought pictures, and uh, they brought letters from maternity wards and so on. Um, the best father of all brought a folded-up cloth diaper, which he inserted in the breast pocket of his suit and had dangling out of it to show that he was a father. Whether a result of the baby boom or a post-war desire for the innocence and normalcy that toy trains represented, the late 1940s and the early 50s witnessed Lionel's most productive and profitable period. In 1947, Lionel introduced a replica of the GG1, an electric locomotive that ran on the Pennsylvania Railroad. Made from die-cast metal, it was true to the prototype in style, proportion, and paint scheme. The GG1 model was very popular with kids on the East Coast. But kids in the Western states didn't have any trains that sported the colors and names of railroads that they were likely to see in real life. So in 1948, the Santa Fe Railroad paid Lionel $7,000 to paint its distinctive design on Lionel's new F3 diesel locomotive. 
Lionel estimated that at best, they might make 16,000 Santa Fe engines in the first year of production. But at its peak, Lionel was building 125 an hour. They had exceeded their annual estimate in just one month. The red, yellow, and silver diesel circled many Christmas trees and became the most popular and recognizable of all Lionel trains. During this post-war period, Lionel introduced some of their best trains and accessories. An all-time favorite was the little smoke pellet that let model steam engines puff smoke, like the real trains. And trackside accessories that automatically loaded and unloaded all sorts of products from boxcars and hopper cars. An entire industrial cycle could be replicated by a child on a sheet of plywood. During the 50s, American Flyer presented Lionel with some strong competition. The biggest difference between the two was that American Flyer trains ran on two rail track instead of three rail track. They were sold by a Connecticut toy maker named A.C. Gilbert. Gilbert's invention of the erector sets early in the century had already brought him fame and fortune. Many kids felt that Gilbert's trains boasted more action, more realism, and more accurate proportions than Lionel trains. Even so, Lionel still managed to outsell American Flyer three to one. In 1952, Lionel produced more than 600,000 locomotives and two million freight and passenger cars. But prosperity disappeared about as fast as it came. In 1954, sales dipped nearly 30%. The next year, they fell by 50%. Part of the blame was placed on the growing popularity of smaller scale model trains in HO gauge. HO, which stands for half O, gave hobbyists more realism and detail than the toy-like Lionel trains. In a desperate attempt to halt the decline in profits, Lionel, once the company that could do no wrong, had to resort to some drastic measures. They realize, hey, we never really marketed to girls. Whoa, you know, the lights go on. So they come up with this insane idea. They'll, or they'll offer a train set for girls, but it'll be called the Lady Lionel. It'll have a pink locomotive. It'll have pastel shades, lilac hoppers, and buttercup yellow cabooses, and things of this sort. So who in their right minds would buy this? Any girl who wants a train wants it because she likes the realism and, and the reality of it. And uh, no, no man or boy is going to buy a pink train. So the Lady Lionel was a disaster. It was kind of like the Edsel of toy trains. The failure of the Lady Lionel was a sign of the changing times. The death knell for toy trains in America came in 1957 with the launching of the Soviet satellite Sputnik. Kids didn't want to play with old-fashioned electric trains while satellites orbited overhead. In 1959, Joshua Cowan unexpectedly sold his Lionel stock to a group of outside investors. The sale left Cowan's son, Lawrence, with no choice but to step down as president. The irony here is that the company that had always been touting father-son relationships and trains as a thing that will unite fathers and sons, Cowan ends up basically selling out his own son. Why did he do this? Nobody's ever clear. Maybe he was concerned about losing money, and so he sells out. Cowan sold his stock to Roy Cohn. Cohn was Cowan's distant cousin, but was better known as Senator Joe McCarthy's chief legal counsel during McCarthy's investigation of communist activity in America. As the new majority shareholder in the company, Cohn selected retired Army General John Medeiros to replace Lawrence Cowan, 
as president of Lionel Trains. Medeiros had served as commander of the Army's Redstone Arsenal and supervised Werner von Braun in the development of the American Satellite Program. Medeiros seemed the perfect choice to lead Lionel into the space age and send profits back into the stratosphere. And Lionel starts coming out with this huge line of missile launchers, rockets, exploding boxcars, uh, helicopter cars, and so on. In a way, they're making them more of a toy. They're going back to sort of play value. But truthfully, uh, they're taking away all of the values that the trains had because now the trains are an instrument of uh, death, destruction, violence, and so on, and the trains had been anything but that in the past. Now, from the top secret car barns of the Lionel Corporation comes the most advanced military train ever developed. It's the new Lionel Minuteman car. It looks like an ordinary freight train. And the Minuteman fires. Enemy target destroyed. Mission but Lionel's misguided plan to heat up profits with Cold War toys completely missed the target. Launching a satellite is fun, but launching your own satellite, that's the most fun of all. Lionel Satellite 3519, ready for launching. Launch satellite. Off she goes into the sky. Lionel's space and military trains didn't reap the anticipated profits, and by the mid-1960s, the line was dropped. In 1965, at the age of 88, Joshua Cowan passed away. His final years spent watching his once beloved toy trains fall from favor. The 1970s were a low point for Lionel. The realism and accuracy of HO scale railroads drew more model train enthusiasts away from Lionel. In a desperate search for a successful formula, Lionel changed hands a number of times. By the 1980s, Lionel trains had regained some of their former glory. And thanks in part to baby boomers looking to fulfill childhood dreams, they had won back a great deal of their popularity. Today, in a suburb of Detroit, Michigan, the Lionel assembly line produces trains with realistic details and advanced electronics that can satisfy the tastes of sophisticated collectors and still fulfill the fantasies of little children. The new Thomas the Tank Engine can be seen as a 90s version of Lionel's irresistible Mickey Mouse handcar of the 1930s. If the amount of track that Lionel makes is any indication of the popularity of its trains, then Lionel is doing very well. No one has the exact numbers, but the employees at Track Assembly, members of the United Auto Workers Union Local 417, estimate that each year they put together enough track to circle the earth twice. It's no coincidence that Lionel's return to profitability paralleled its return to the philosophy of the company's founder. Joshua Lionel Cowan, when he started the company, didn't set out to create a collectible product company. He set out to make fun trains that bring families together. Today, the company works to perpetuate Cowan's legacy. 
The legacy of, of Lionel has, has really three parts. It's, it's a legacy of fun, and, and, and that's the most important thing, creating products that people are going to have fun with. Uh, the second component of the legacy is a legacy of bringing families together and allowing parents to spend quality time with children. And I think the third part of the legacy is the legacy of innovation. And that is, at times, the toughest to, to sustain. Innovation in the digital age means bringing computer technology to model trains. When you look at our products, you're still going to see the products largely as you saw them years ago. What you don't see is that we have very sophisticated, latest generation computer chips built inside of them. When you blow the whistle on one of our uh, engines, for example, you, in most cases, are listening to an actual digital recording of the real-life counterpart to that model train. We actually send sound engineers uh, out to a rail yard or out to a museum, if it happens to be an older train, to actually record uh, that train, to record that whistle, to record that horn, to record the sound of that train running, even the sound of its brakes screeching. We also use digital technology to give each train its own digital identity so that we can communicate with each individual train and tell it what to do. In the summer of 1997, Lionel publicly demonstrated a prototype of a new way of sharing the fun of toy trains. They mounted a miniature television camera and tiny stereo microphones in the cab of one of their locomotives. The view from the cab gave the operator an unprecedented way of experiencing the miniature world. The signal from the camera was also transmitted live over the internet through the World Wide Web. It's a concept they call Lionel Vision. It's really quite fascinating to see this world, the world of a model train layout from, in a scale perspective. It really makes it seem bigger than life. In the future, theoretically, you could have a situation where one hobbyist is traveling around another hobbyist layout. A hobbyist in Chicago, for example, is visiting via the internet the, a hobbyist in Seattle and traveling his layout from the perspective of, of his engine or his engineer and, and making uh, appropriate comments, uh, if you will. So it's, it, it, again, using technology to enhance the concept of not only having fun but bringing people uh, together. I think the hobby is undergoing a change, but it's a very exciting change. It seems to me that more people in the hobby are asking, what can I do with my train? The important point there is to give them ideas of what they can do, to teach them how to build layouts, to teach them again how to play with your trains. The fastest growing segment of the hobby is the construction and operation of realistic layouts for O-gauge trains. It's called high rail. The trains run on typical O-gauge three rail track, but everything else is more detailed than on traditional toy train layouts. Not only do the locomotives look more like real trains, they sound like real trains and act like real trains. It's behavior that high rail modelers call prototypical. It becomes a challenge to see how real can we make a miniature of anything look, whether it's an airplane, a fire engine, a train. Let's be prototypical. Let's make it exactly the way it really looked then or today. This layout recreates a day in the life of Southern California railroading during the 1940s and 50s. For visitors, it's more than a showcase for trains and scenery. It's a history lesson. It's what's known in railroading as the transition period when steam locomotives were disappearing, diesel locomotives became the major means of pulling trains. Now, since I'm a native of Los Angeles uh, and love the southwestern United States, it became something more than just a, a, a train. It's become a very, very happy experience for me, and I continue to live that experience by studying the history of that period.
Since toy trains first appeared in the 19th century, they have entertained and educated children all over the world. Toy trains narrowly escaped extinction on a number of occasions, but now they prosper in the age of computers. A new toy train remains a wonderful way to explore exciting possibilities. An old toy train is a time machine, a way back to the world of father and son railroading. You can't go back to your childhood, you can't be a little kid again, you can't be looking up adoringly at your father, but at least through the trains is, is a way of acting that out again, of holding on to it. The trains are a tangible reminder of what was. And you hold this little box car in your hand and everything comes back to you. And I think it's wonderful that that box car still exists. So sort of by laying on of the hands, I can feel those days again.